Hello um, and welcome to this talk about inference um, in the FSL course. So inference first of all, what is inference? Um, well it's what you do once you have done all the other things we talked about. So you have now created a statistical map or an image where each pixel value represents a statistic of some sort like a T statistic or an F statistic. And now from this map you want to infer where the activations are, i.e. you want to say which parts of this map can you trust the statistic such you can say that there has been an activation here. Now the talk is going to be given in several episodes and this is the outline of the full talk um, and all the episodes taken together. So first of all we're going to talk a little bit about null hypothesis and null distributions um, and these are just tools of classical inference testing um, not at all limited to imaging. Then we're going to talk about multiple comparisons. Again it's not limited to imaging but it is a problem that is particularly relevant to imaging. We're going to talk about different ways of being surprised or different ways of inferring that in this map something special and unique is going on um, and that could either be that we find one voxel with a very very high statistic like a t statistic of 10 or something like that or it could also be that we have a large cluster of spatially connected voxels that all have a reasonably high t value but not, not extremely high. We're then going to go on to talk about parametric versus non-parametric tests. It's a very important part of it. We're going to talk about something called TFCE, Threshold Free Enhanced Clusters, Cluster Enhancement. Um, and we're going to talk about something called FDR, False Discovery Rate, um, which you can think of as a different philosophy in terms of, of, of inferring change. Right, so the first thing uh, we're going to talk about is a null hypothesis and null distribution. Um, but in order to explain this, we're first going to talk about the task of classical inference. What is it we want to achieve with classical inference? Well, what we want to do is that, given some data, we want to know if, for example, a mean is different from zero. So you've got a group of data points here. Now, is the mean of this group of data points significantly different from zero? Or, we might want to know if two means are different. Again, so we have two groups. Um, each associated with a mean, and are those two means significantly different? And in order to be able to do this task, we need some tools. And the first tool is a null hypothesis. And what the null hypothesis is, is typically the opposite of what we actually hope. So, for example, we might say in the, the first example here, if, if this mean is different from zero, the null hypothesis would be there is no effect of treatment, i.e. the mean is zero, and then we go to see if we can reject that null hypothesis and therefore say that it is not uh, the same as zero. Or the null hypothesis, null hypothesis, if we have two groups, might be that the mean is the same for the two groups. Right? There's no difference between the two groups. But clearly, typically what we actually hope for is that there will be a difference there. Right. The next thing we need is a test statistic. And what a test statistic is, is really, it's really nothing more than formalizing and quantifying something that we all know intuitively. So if you look at these examples, so these are paired vertically. So what we have here is we have two groups and we have a big difference between the groups. And here we have two groups and a small difference between them. And we trust the big difference more than we trust the small difference. Similarly here we have two groups. In one case, um, the spread within the groups is relatively small. In the other case, the spread within the groups within the groups um, is very, very high. So again, we trust the ones where the spread within the group is small or the uncertainty is small, more than we trust the one where the uncertainty is great. And here we have two groups again with many data points. And down here we have two groups with small or a small number of data points. And again, we trust more in the case when we have many data points, more many data, more than we trust when we have little data. And any t statistic or any statistic you can think of reflects precisely this. And one example of a statistic that does this is the t statistic. Um, so you can see here the t value. If we have a large difference, we say we trust it. If we have many me measurements, we say we trust it. And if we have small variability, that also means the t value increases, and we say we trust it. So literally, it's just a it's just a way of formalizing um, what we already know. 
right? Um, the t-statistic expressed in you know, linear model lingo. Um, so you've seen all these things before in the previous talks. We have the contrast weight vector. We have our parameter estimates. In this case, the parameter estimates uh, um, represent the group mean of two different groups. And we have our design, and this is the design matrix. And in this case, in this case, it simply implements a model that looks for the difference between two different means or two different groups. Right. So what we're going to do now um, is we are going to look at something called a null distribution. Um, because as I said before, um, what we are using the statistic for is we are formalizing something that we already know. If the statistic is big, um, then we say, OK, we trust this. Uh, but at what cases do we trust and what, what's the reason for trust? And this is where we need the null distribution. So let us assume that we have a case where there's no difference. OK, and we do an experiment. So we, we know we have just pick, you know, a sample at random. So there's no difference between the two groups. And we do this. We pick the random sample. We fit the data to the model and we get a T value. And as I said, in this case, there is no difference between the two groups, and yet we get a p-value of 2.19. Right. What we're going to do now is we're going to do a little thought experiment that we keep repeating this exact same experiment time after time, each time, acquire new data, fitting the model again, and calculating a t-value, and then storing away that t-value to see what we get. So the first time, we got 2.19, so we store that away as 2.19. We acquire new data, this time we got minus 0.51. We acquire new data, this time we got 0.49. We acquire new data, and just by chance we happen to get 2.19 again, this time minus 1.66. And we just keep doing this and keep doing this and keep doing this. So, the question then is, why is this helpful? Well, remember that this, this what we've done here is we have sample this distribution, this null distribution, under the null hypothesis. So for all of these cases, we know that there is no difference between the two groups. So what we now look at is we can see what is the chance, what is the likelihood of getting a given t-value or larger, even when there actually is no difference between the two groups. And we can do that by simply calculating. So if you want to know how, what, what is the chance, what is the, the probability of getting a t-value greater than 3 when the null hypothesis is true, what we do then is we simply calculate the number of the cases or the number of times that we got a t-value greater than 3 compared with the total number of samples we took. So we can see that in roughly 1% of the cases we get a t-value greater than 3 even when the null hypothesis is true. Or we can say that in 5% of cases, roughly, we get a t-value greater than 1.99, again, when the null hypothesis is true. And best of all, this distribution is known, so we can calculate it. We don't need to do this sort of silly thought experiments or doing all these different um, experiments. So we can calculate this, there's this mathematical formula for it, much as we can calculate a sine or a cosine or something like that. Provided, of course, that the error in our data is normal distributed. Right. So, uh, how can we then do this? Or I use this. I mean, why? Why is this useful? Well, to illustrate this, let us again do a, a, a simple experiment. Um, and in this simple experiment, the null hypothesis is that the two mean, the means of the two different groups, is the same. And the alternate hypothesis is that the mean of the first group is greater than the mean of the second group. And with this, we do an experiment. We acquire the data, and we get a t-value. So we've now acquired the data, we get a t-value, and the t-value is 2.64. So now what we can do, given that we have this null distribution, we can then take this value of 2.64 and ask ourselves the question. Now, if the null hypothesis really is true, what is the likelihood, what is the probability that we would get such a large value as 2.64 just by chance, right? or large, as large as that, or larger just by chance? And it turns out that's roughly 1.5% chance. And that translates into saying that if we reject the null hypothesis in this case, 
experiment, i.e. we're saying that there actually is an experiment, uh, the experimental effect, when the null is actually true, i.e. When, when there truly isn't one, there's only a 1.5% risk that we are doing so erroneously, i.e. there's only a 1.5% risk that we are saying that there is an activation when there isn't an activation if the null hypothesis is true. And then we can say, well, we can live with that. Well, I can at least. And typically what we do is we, we pick some sort of arbitrary risk level that we are happy with. And the typical risk level is 5%, 0 0.05. And what that actually means is that if we, if we threshold something at 0 0.05, what it means is that, okay, if the null hypothesis like if the null hypothesis really were true, i.e. there is no activation here, there's only a 5% risk that we are making a mistake by rejecting the null hypothesis there. Right, uh, so what I've been doing now is I've been talking about false positives um, and you know, mentioning that word. So let's just do a little bit of, of terminology here, false positives and false negatives. And you know what does that actually mean? What, what are they? So, when we perform an experiment, uh, we first of all define a null hypothesis. So, for example, a null hypothesis might be that the mean equals zero. Now, what can happen? Like, what, 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 what can be the case in this experiment? First of all, we have the true state of affairs. And, you know, the state of affairs that we, dash, we don't actually know. And that true state of affairs could be either that the null hypothesis is true, or it could be that the null hypothesis is false. You know, this is, is something unknown to us, but which we want to say something about, we want to infer on this. Then the next thing is that can happen is that we either reject the null hypothesis because we get a statistic that is you know, too large or large enough for us to reject it, or we can decide that we don't reject the null hypothesis if we think that our statistic isn't large enough. So this is our decision as opposed to the true state of affairs. So now what we can do is we can do this little two by two table and say, so on over here is the true state of affairs, affairs, either that the null hypothesis is true or that it is false. And over here we have our decision. We don't reject the null hypothesis or we reject the null hypothesis. Now, if we end up in either of these two squares, where we say the null hypothesis is true and we don't reject the null hypothesis, then, then we're happy. We have correctly concluded that there was no activation. Or the null hypothesis is false and we reject the null hypothesis. Again, we're happy because we have correctly concluded that there is an activation here. But sometimes we end up in these other squares. So for example, if the null hypothesis is true, but we reject it, I will say there is an effect, then we say that we have a false positive. Or if indeed the null hypothesis is false, but we don't have enough statistical power to reject it, then we end up with a false negative. And another word for these things is false positives. It's also called a type one error. And a false negative is also called a type two error. And importantly, in all the cases in classical inference testing, what we're doing is we are controlling the type 1 error at some level. So if you, for example, saying that, okay, we are going to reject the null hypothesis at the 0 0.05 level, what that means is that we control the false positive rate to be no more than 5% or a 5% risk of a false positive. The false negative rate, we don't control and we have no idea what it is. And you know, quite probably in most imaging studies, because they tend to be quite underpowered, we have quite a large false negative rate. Now, the next thing that we're going to talk about in this part is multiple comparisons and family-wise error. So first of all, multiple comparisons. So in a neuroimaging study, we typically perform many tests. I mean, you might not think of it like that, but actually what we're doing is we are performing a large number of t-tests, right? So we're asking the question, is there a difference here? That's one t-test. Is there a difference here? Well, that's another t-test. Is there a difference here? That's another t-test. And this is true for every single voxel in the brain. So what we're actually doing is we're not doing one test. We are doing many, many simultaneous tests. Right, so let's now, let's now go to the case where we have um, done a 
uh, done a study we have calculated um, the t values the z z values uh, and what we happen to have here is a z map where we have calculated the statistic of each voxel and i happen to know that the null hypothesis is true everywhere um, there i.e there are no activations so we calculate the statistic and we go to our null distribution and we find the t value that gives us a 0.05 percent false positive rate so 0.05 i.e. 5 percent false positive rate and that's t value 1.64 and we threshold our set map of that and we get this so we know that there are no activations at all and yet we end up with 16 clusters with 288 voxels five and a half percent roughly of the voxel that is a lot of false positives but if you think about it this is not surprising at all this is exactly what we would expect because we have done a large number of independent tests and what we're doing here is we're controlling each and every test at the five percent level so we would expect to find five percent of all of these voxels to be false positives so and that's clearly not an acceptable um, state uh, of affairs so the the classical way or the, the yeah the traditional way of doing this would be to say okay so we want to have a control the error at a five percent level and we are having 5255 voxel and if you say that these are about 5255 independence tests what we're doing then is we're taking our tentative p-value our tentative false positive rate and we divide that by the number of independent tests we have and we get a value of 10 to the 99 is 5 so now instead of thresholding this null null distribution at the 0.05 level we are doing at the 10 to the minus 5 level and that's way out into the tail of this distribution where the t value or the z score is 5.65 okay so we try now to threshold our z map at a z score or t value of 5.65 and we say oh no false positives great bonferroni did a good job but 5.65 that sounds very high doesn't it and it is it is indeed very high um, so if we look at the observed values in the set map we can see that thresholding this at you know 0 0.05 uncorrected well that is way too lenient but the bond phenomenon threshold that is you know, is just way too strict it's way too harsh so what we want is something in between and the problem here the reason that the bond phenomenon threshold is way too harsh is because those tests are not independent so if you look at this map you can see that it's smoothly varying in space so this test is actually quite well, you know quite closely related to the neighboring test so we don't have all those independent tests we have a much smaller number of independent tests so what is it we want what is it we really want well we want to control something that's called the family wise error so this slide here is literally just to, uh, to sort of explain the concept of what family bias error is and why this is something that we want, right? So let's say we have performed a series of identical studies. These are all identical. And let's further say that the null hypothesis is true for all of these studies, i.e. the comparison between groups that we just picked at random. So there should be no difference at all between them. So each of these set map is the end result of one of these studies where the null hypothesis in, is true in it all. What we want to find now is one threshold, one threshold that we can apply to all of these maps so that only once in all of these 20 studies do we find a voxel above this threshold. And you know, I've now applied this threshold and I find this voxel here belonging to that little area there. So what we see now is we, that we now have, we're back at a 5% family-wise error. And what that means is that only once out of, you know, one, one out of 20 studies do we get a false positive. I.e., well, you can even go further and say, well, only in one out of 20 paper we write do we have a false positive. And that's the threshold we want to find. And as we go into the next section or the next episode of this talk, we're now going to find out how we go about finding that threshold. But that is for the next episode. Um, so thank you very much for listening to this episode.
and welcome back later.